broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome everyone into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Everyone, how you doing? Welcome on to the program. So today on the show, we have computer and technology news for the hour. Tons of different stories. I mean, I'm already looking at 20 plus ones and we haven't even finished yet. But yeah, everyone, it's going to be a great uh, a great hour and we hope that you had a wonderful weekend and you are ready for some Computer America. So before we get started, ComputerAmerica.com is where you'll find everything, including past shows, future shows, all the shows, everything you need to know about the program, including contests, giveaways, social media links, uh, podcasts, all that and more. If you can't catch us live on IRN, then that is the next best place to do it. So everyone, uh, again, we hope that you're doing well and you are ready for the program. So everyone, without further ado, com- Computer and Technology News brought to you by Computer America. Now, let's go ahead and get things started with, uh, yep, computer technology news, and let's see, let's see, let's talk about, yeah, a lot of these stories are uh, about the horrible, you know, uh, mess that's happening over in Afghanistan, which we are not going to cover by any means, and so, you know, uh, rest assured about that. Let's uh, let's go ahead and, yeah, and again, just looking through the last of the stories that we could have had, and looks like none there. So, let's go ahead and start with, uh, actually, one that I wanted to uh, really talk about was um, uh, Tesla, and yeah, the United States is officially probing Tesla in regards to its autopilot system, which, you know, is uh, to be expected in so many ways. And, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, talk about this, saying that, uh, well, U.S. probing uh, auto- autopilot problems on 765,000 Tesla vehicles, and you know they definitely seem to have a case here, considering the fact that it has gotten uh, gotten into trouble, which everyone was expecting. These things were not going to be uh, perfect off, you know, right off the uh, production line, and even so, uh, you know, even when you engage autopilot, they still tell you things like, you know, pay attention to the road, don't, uh, you know, don't let your hands leave for more than a minute. You have to actively manage your autopilot system, which kind of defeats the uh, point of calling it an autopilot system and probably would have been more uh, appropriate to call it kind of a driver assist uh, program. But autopilot obviously gives it the idea that it can run completely on its own. Not so much, says the U.S. government. They're, they have opened a formal investigation into Tesla's autopilot uh, partially automated driving system after a, uh, which, you know, that alone right there, uh, again, this coming from the Associated Press, saying that Tesla's autopilot partially automated driving system tells you all I need to know right there. It's uh, a little misleading. They're saying that after collisions with parked emergency vehicles, and that's a problem, the investigation covers 765,000 vehicles, almost everything that Tesla has sold in the U.S. since the start of the 2014 model. If you don't recall, the 2014 model was one of the first ones where they said, if you buy this model or later, you can have autopilot or, you know, you can enable autopilot down the road uh, because it comes with a full array of cameras and sensors and everything that autopilot at the at the time was said to have needed. So 765,000 vehicles of the crashes identified by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration as part of the probe, 17 people were injured and one was killed. Now, 
yes, I mean, completely look into it. Obviously, autopilot has been, um, you know, kind of put forward as something that it's not really supposed to be. And that is either a problem on people's understanding or Tesla and, uh, you know, kind of false uh, pretenses of selling these vehicles. But still, 17 uh, incidents out of 765,000 vehicles that have seen a lot of road time that's actually not bad, but it is with an untested new different system, and that's the important part. Now, they said that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, said, yeah, uh, says that it has identified 11 crashes since 2018 in which uh, Teslas on autopilot or traffic aware cruise control have hit vehicles at scenes where first responders have used flashing lights, flares, and illuminated aero board or, cone, or cones warning of hazards. The agency announced the action Monday in a posting on its website. Now, you know, the immediate uh, kind of reaction from me and should be from a lot of people out there is that if there is in, you know, I'm sorry, if there are emergency vehicles and first responders out there, uh, you know, any traffic accident or something that's obviously causing a change in the flow of traffic, why the heck are these people still on autopilot? That seems like the number one condition, like, you know, inclement weather, uh, hazardous road conditions, or, you know, kind of unusual driving conditions, which I would definitely say that uh, first responders being on the scene, uh, being one of them, why the heck are these people still using it? Like, if anything, this should be an investigation into those people because that's like using uh, cruise control when there's clearly a traffic accident, you know, uh, coming up. Like, yeah, you know, it's not going to take everything into consideration. Now, the autopilot system, obviously, was supposed to handle these, you know, handle this uh, better. It's supposed to take note of its surroundings and actually respond to the road. It's not just supposed to keep your lane. It's not just supposed to keep your speed or keep you behind the person in front of you. No, it is supposed to do it all. It's supposed to uh, keep track of it. But we have seen Teslas where they have, um, you know, maybe there was a city truck where they were towing or, or actually they were about to install install traffic lights and the Tesla was uh, very confused or at least the autopilot system was very confused because it noticed that there was a, uh, a traffic signal ahead even though it was on the back of a truck not even installed. There was a case where uh, a Tesla was uh, registering a full moon as a yellow light at a traffic stop, and it was causing it to have issues. Clearly, there are going to be many of these little situations that are going to give it trouble and, you know, give the software trouble. AI can only be so smart at the beginning. Uh, my, my point is, these people should not have been using autopilot when there are first responders. And if autopilot was at all engaged during these situations, that almost seems like a failure on the driver's part, more so than the software. Uh, that's It's just not ready for that level of, uh, you know, of attention. But... I guess the point of the investigation is also concerning why is it that these things are crashing into first responders when they have so many flashing lights and things that humans are so ready to pick up on and yet these automated systems cannot. Why is that? And that, I believe, is the, uh, yeah, the, the main thrust of the investigation. Now, they said that the probe is another sign that the president is taking a tougher stance on automated, uh, yeah, on automated uh, vehicle safety than under previous administrations. Previously, the agency was reluctant to regulate the new technology for fear of hampering adoption of potentially life-saving systems. And what they mean by that is things like auto, you know, kind of auto braking, lane assists. Um, you know, there are. Uh, like all these little pieces together uh, with an active driver actually do prevent a lot of accidents. But then it's that moment when you take, uh, you know, when you allow people to take their attention from the road, that's when these uh, helpful little systems that are here, there, and, you know, can, you know, really assist the driver actually start to cause the driver to be more dangerous or, you know, be in a more dangerous situation. Now, they're saying that the investigation covers Tesla's entire model lineup, including Model Y, X, S, and 3 from 2014 to 2021. 
Uh, they also mentioned that last year the NTSB blamed Tesla drivers and uh, Tesla drivers and lax regulation by the National uh, Highway Traffic Safety Administration for two collisions which Tesla's crashed beneath crossing tractor trailers. Uh, the NTSB took the unusual step of accusing uh, the administration of contributing to the crash for failing to make sure automakers put safeguards in place to limit the use of electronic driving systems. Uh, the agency made the determination after investigation of a 2019 Delray Beach, Florida hometown uh, for uh, in which a 50-year-old driver of a Model 3 was killed. The car was driving on autopilot when neither the driver nor the autopilot system braked or tried to avoid a tractor trailer crossing in its path. And the most obvious you know, reason as to why that happened, I would imagine, would be that Tractor trailers are much higher off the ground, and you know uh, the cameras look in front of, behind, side to side, but they don't look, you know, kind of slightly elevated because you know what would be floating in midair. Well, turns out tractor trailers would essentially be floating in midair to the technology, and they have since, uh, you know, they, they have since probably patched that. You know, you don't want too many people dying from the same thing over and over and over again. Autopilot has frequently been misused by Tesla drivers who have been caught driving drunk or even riding in the backseat while a car rolled down a California highway. A message was left early Monday seeking comment from Tesla, which has disbanded its media relations office, which is very uh, notable. The fact that uh, when it comes to media relations, Tesla has taken the unusual step of essentially deleting all of their presence from Facebook, Twitter, so on and so forth. And of course, you know, any media media relations in the company doesn't happen, they still put out press releases, but yeah, most of the news and uh, information about Tesla comes directly from Elon Musk's Twitter. So there you go. Uh, Tesla and other manufacturers warn that drivers using the systems must be ready to intervene at all times. In addition to crossing semis, Tesla's uh, Tesla's using autopilot uh, users. Uh, autopilot have crashed into stopped emergency vehicles and a roadway barrier. I remember that uh, the roadway barrier that happened, I believe, in California, where it um, you know tried to cross a median and it crashed into uh, it crashed into a median. In that barrier, because it thought it was trying to do a U-turn, or, or you know, thought that there was a U-turn when there wasn't one. Uh, again, due to unusual lane conditions with the barriers and construction, things that you know should be kind of expected. And yeah, just sent that poor guy straight into a wall and blew the car up. Not good. So they mentioned that Tesla's failure to effectively monitor drivers to make sure that they're paying attention should be the top priority in the probe. Tesla's uh, detect pressure on the steering wheel to make sure that drivers are engaged, but they often fool the system. And I've definitely heard about that. They have like weighted chains that they put on the steering wheel so that they never have to touch it. Uh, People are treating the obvious safety measure as uh, something that, uh, you know, more of an annoyance and something that should be bypassed. It's almost like when, uh, you know, really bad electricians, uh, you know, maybe if a breaker keeps flipping, instead of trying to find the problem, they just duct tape the breaker, you know, uh, on. It's stuff like that. You know, it's, uh, it's equally as stupid and can definitely lead to, you know, huge problems, including death. So they mentioned that it's very easy to bypass to bypass the steering pressure thing they said. It's been going on since 2014. We have been discussing this for a long time now. The most obvious answer and one that uh, you know a lot of other car manufacturers are going to start putting in uh, here soon is actually a driver monitoring camera, a camera that points directly at the driver's face and it's going to start detecting if you're falling asleep, if you're drunk, if you uh, you know if you're not paying attention, if you haven't looked at the road in 10 seconds you know little things like that the camera is going to start picking up on and warn drivers hey you know shape up Uh, that is what they're wondering why hasn't tesla put something like this in because there are tons of different cameras in a tesla including one that actually filmed the cabin uh, you know, why Why has a system like this not been put in place? The obvious answer would be for privacy, but still, uh, you know, lives could have been saved with this technology, and it's not really that invasive if, you know, the footage never actually leaves the car. 
Alberta. Uh, they mentioned that uh, since then, the HC said that there were crashes in Laguna Beach, California, Nor- uh, Norwalk, Connecticut, Cloverdale, Indiana, Westbridge, Massachusetts, uh, Co- uh, Cochise, Cochise County, Arizona, essentially Arizona, Cal- uh, North Carolina, Texas, Michigan, and Florida. So all over the country, these things are encountering strange road conditions. So they said that uh, Tesla uses a camera-based system, a lot of computing power, and sometimes radar to spot obstacles and then decide what the vehicle should do. But they mentioned that the company's radar was plagued by false positive signals and would stop cars after determining overpasses were obstacles. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not an ideal system whatsoever, but I really do believe it is probably the only system that had any chance of making it into these cars and getting some kind of self-driving technology out there because the you know the other answer I'm sorry the other answer to this was lidar and lidar cost you know tens of thousands of dollars it was not something that you were going to do overnight but still it has caused issues and that's what the national highway uh, transportation safety administration uh, is going to look into so yep We'll, uh, we'll see. So there you go. That's story number one. And of course, uh, Tesla said that their share price, or I'm sorry, their share price obviously fell a good deal. So you can see that there. So, uh, yep. Let's go ahead and continue on here to the next story. Uh, let's see. So tons of different stories that we can definitely cover here. Uh, a little bit of data misuse by Dallas who saw that coming. How about this one? A little bit of uplifting. If you are looking for a graphics card, you may know it's uh, incredibly hard. Uh, obviously, with the downturn in cryptocurrency, it may have gotten a little bit easier. But finding a brand new, uh, but finding a brand new graphics card, not that easy. Very, very out of stock, and sometimes you have to pay the scalper prices, which can be 50% above MSRP, if not worse. Well, this may alleviate a little bit of that. And they're saying that uh, Intel Arc, yeah, the company's first gaming GPUs will debut in 2022. And for all those who are completely oblivious, Intel, obviously known for its uh, its chipsets and its CPUs, uh, when it comes to graphics, they have integrated graphics. So that means those are that's pretty much the bottom of the barrel when you buy a laptop or a computer with integrated graphics. That is like you know not even a dedicated. Uh, graphics card that thing can handle like maybe displaying you know websites and email it's not really going to get you that much further so intel has never really been in the business of selling discrete graphics cards graphics cards on their own that is coming to uh you know that's going to change where it looks like they're trying to take on amd on their home ground so intel has chosen a name for its high performance consumer graphics products saying that they will be called intel arc the branding will cover the hardware and software sides of the high-end graphics cards as well as the service. Uh, the first Arc GPUs, codename Alchemist, so there you go, will arrive in the first quarter of 2022. So actually, that's not bad. Just like, uh, what, six months away? It's not bad at all. Uh, and it will be for desktops and laptops as Intel looks to take on a- uh, NVIDIA and AMD. And honestly, with uh, you know, with Intel constantly losing ground to AMD and obviously uh, being very non-competitive with NVIDIA, um, it's, it surprised me that it took them this long to really get into the, uh, yeah, that they really... I'm sorry, it took them this long to get into GPUs because they've been essentially doing a lot of the work, just not integrating it into GPUs, just CPUs. And by the way, they've even included later names for the future generations of GPUs, including Battle Mage, Celestial, and Druid. So, some nice fantasy names there for you. Uh, They're saying that the Alchemist GPUs will support hardware-based ray tracing, mesh shading, variable rate shading, and direct 12x ultimate. So essentially they're saying uh, these GPUs will include the latest in graphics card technology. You know, it's not like they're going to uh, skip ray tracing. They're not going to uh, skip, you know, rate shading, whatever the heck that is. Yep, they're going to include it all. 
And they also claim that they'll be capable of artificial intelligence driven super sampling as well. And that's very important because a lot of graphics cards that are built nowadays are actually built with AI in mind. Uh, I would say even, you know, Obviously, for uh, kind of consumer level graphics cards, it's not that important. But a lot of Nvidia's, uh, I'm sorry, Nvidia and AMD's business is actually on the AI uh, supercomputer, uh, you know, kind of server side, where they have to have this capability to do AI and store a lot of data and compute a lot of data. So, there you go. And they said that uh, the Alchemist cards are based on the XE HPG microarchitecture blend of XE. So, XE is, of course, their Xeon or uh, Xenon uh, based processors, which is more server. But yeah, it uh, makes a lot of sense that they would try to piggyback off of what they've already done with uh, you know, some of those high performance server things that they do and try to bring it into a GPU. Intel says it will share more details about the first Arc product later this year. Year, and they also gave a quick peek, a quick peek at Arc Graphics in action. Which, if you're watching the video portion, we'll uh, go ahead and uh, play that. Yep. So this is the first look at uh, high performance graphics cards, uh, right there. And they said that uh, it showed games including Forza Horizon 4, Psychonauts 2, PlayerUnknown Battleground, uh, and Metro Exodus running on the technology. And it looks like it can run Crisis Remastered technology. And uh, let's see, for uh, well, I guess that's nice of Intel if they can bring the the performance for price. Yep, and that's. Uh, you know, and that's always been the thing about uh, Intel was that you pay kind of top notch for the best technology, but when it came to the actual price to performance, you know, yeah, you could pay five hundred dollars for one of the best CPUs out there, but then you could get, um, you know, an AMD that can run maybe you know ten, fifteen, twenty percent uh, slower for fifty percent of the price. And that price to, uh, you know, that price comparison really made a big difference when it came to building new computers, kind of mid-range, and let's face it, the majority of computers out there, uh, we can definitely see how well it works. And to, uh, and of course, to the comment of, you know, drivers that don't stink on ice, Intel works with almost everything. So I'm hoping that if they build uh, you know, their processors and everything works with Intel. We know that for sure. Like that is the one criticism that AMD has is that it kind of crashes more than Intel. That's, you know, to say that maybe Intel doesn't crash 99% of the time and AMD doesn't crash 98% of the time, but Intel is notably very stable. I'm hoping that if they have a discrete GPU, they kind of carry that over and make sure that everything works uh, interchangeably with all of this. So, and uh, there you go, and I'm, I'm hoping that the price is there. I know it's going to be a premium. It's going to be a new product. They have a lot of research uh, and development costs to kind of eat and, you know, kind of work on. Intel has sunk a lot of money into recent research and development of new products, but yeah, it's, um, they, their price needs to be comparable to in, uh, I'm sorry, to NVIDIA and AMD at the same time, I'm wondering if they can pull that off. Um, I, I'm excited. Uh, obviously, everyone, as we say, with AMD and NVIDIA and now with Intel, if you want to know the true performance of these things, don't just trust NVIDIA, don't just trust AMD, don't, don't just trust Intel on their internal benchmarks because they are going to rig those tests to be as idyllic and picture perfect for their own hardware as they possibly can. They're going to squeeze every bit out of it on their, uh, you know, on their charts. Now, wait until third parties, wait until you get, um, you know, uh, other people with their hands on this hardware and put them through actual tests in real world conditions. And that's what you really want to look for. So I'm curious, I'm interested. I hope that, you know, not even price competitiveness to uh, performance. I'm also hoping that this brings the whole GPU market kind of back in line because the third competitor making even more chips, like there's such a, there is such a, uh, I don't want to say dearth. There's such a lack of product available that 
you know, it doesn't even really matter if it's that good to begin with. And that, you know, may play to Intel strengths. If you make GPUs, someone out there will want them. Either big companies, servers, individuals, Bitcoin miners, people are going to, uh, people are really going to want GPUs. There's so few out there for, for the demand that I think it's going to make Intel Arc actually succeed, regardless on, on if it's good or not. Uh, as long as they're somewhat stable and the drivers don't suck and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, it it's going to be successful because, man, you just cannot keep good GPUs on the shelf. So, it's a wait and see, but I really do doubt that there's going to be any kind of issue with this. So there you go. Uh, Intel Arc, keep your eyes out for that. Now that's story number two. Story number three. Let's, uh, <laughs> all these are pretty heavy. How about, let's do something a little bit lighter and lighter and not necessarily, uh, well, Actually, this has been causing people headaches, and I had no idea. Uh, I never noticed that Twitter actually changed their font, but here we go. They're saying that, uh, yeah, GPUs are definitely crazy right now. Uh, they're saying that Twitter, uh, Twitter's new design to get a fix, uh, yeah, to get a fix after headache complaints. So check this one out. Twitter is making changes to its new design after users complained of headaches and discomfort. Who knew? And they said that uh, unveiled only last week, the redesign mainly involved high contrast colors and a custom designed font called Chirp. And, you know, custom fonts, they're, they're a thing. It's not too difficult to, um, you know, to kind of make one, but fonts do make a, a really, really big difference. And, you know, some people claim that it's kind of what made uh, Microsoft Word, uh, you know, with its whole Times New Roman and Arial font uh, successful was because it was so easy to read and it was just the preferred font for so many applications. Like it, yeah, some people claim that fonts put Microsoft on the map. Like, it, it does make a difference. So, they mentioned that at the time, the social network said it might feel weird at first, but would improve content consumption and clean up visual clutter. Yes, because essentially, uh, if you read more, scroll more, post more, Twitter's happy. So, that's, that's the only metric that really matters. And they mentioned that, uh, yep, so high contrast colors, and they tried to make everything uh, obvious as they thought, but it was causing headaches. They're saying that it's smaller and denser now, which means I need to strain my eyes more to read, one user wrote. Another said, it is just impossible to read if one has a visual and or processing impairment. So they even have a, uh, a tweet directly from Twitter, uh, from Twitter's accessibility account, saying that we're making contrast changes on all buttons to make them easier on the eye because you told us the new look is uncomfortable for people with sensory sensitivities. We're listening and iterating, which is important. You know, you can make all these changes. It's just uh, maybe a little bit more testing on a small sample size, you know, gradually roll the whole design out instead of uh, just lumping it all out there at once. But then, of course, listen to feedback, which is what it seems like they're saying. So they mentioned that, uh, and the next day it said, we've identified issues with the Chirp font for Windows users and are actively working on fixing it. Many users had also complained about the, uh, uh, about the new font on mobile phones, and they announced that the new font... In January, Twitter head of branding uh, said it had been designed by Swiss type foundry Grilly to improve how we convey emotion and imperfection in the widely used standard type Helvetica was not up for the job. Eh, eh, I don't know. Um, yeah, and obviously people with chronic migraines would not have noticed, but, you know, um, I it, it's funny. Like, I spend so much time on a computer that I actually have everything very minimal. I have dark modes everywhere. Uh, I play with very low volume, you know, play video games with very low volume. Uh, everything is kind of on a larger font and, you know, just to make it easier on the eyes. Like I know that I spend so much time on a computer that if any little thing is going to bug me over the course of, of a huge, you know, of a normal day, it's really going to get bad. So I always make sure to, you know, try to try to make it easier on myself. Uh, yeah, so 
there you go. I hope that everyone out there does the exact same. So they mentioned that... Uh, so uh, they also mentioned the person in charge of the whole chirp font saying type in 280 character doses is the foundation of Twitter and the history of the company. We've either relied on someone else's typeface uh, from SF Pro and, Robo- and Roboto to Helvetica New in our brand and now Chirp is their default one. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I Fonts make such a subtle difference that it's kind of hard to kind of immediately gut reaction say that this is good or this is bad. But yeah, and you know, for everyone watching the video portion, you can see it here. Uh, let's see, I think we can just go ahead and pull this right on up. Uh, yeah, Chirp, there you go. Um, it's kind of blocky, kind of, kind of expressive. Uh, they mentioned that it's to also kind of highlight the imperfections of it. So there are little imperfections, you know, uh, the legs of the R, for instance, are a bit of a different, uh, width from one another. Uh, overall, I mean, yeah, it's something that they can, uh, definitely improve on. So, but now that the but now that thread is filling with with replies urging Twitter to use Helvetica or whatever the user's default system font is, which actually sounds like kind of the perfect thing. Uh, give people the choice, you know, let them know, hey, there is a custom Twitter font, and you might like that. But they should usually just default to whatever the system's default font is because people can set that on their PCs and in their phones all the time. So it's pretty weird. So they, uh, they mentioned that Twitter initially uh, rallied against a, a 2014 redesign and the complaint about the 2017 replacement. Snapchat failed. Facebook failed. Yeah, social media. And when you have millions of users getting it right for everyone at the same time, is not going to be easy. So, there you go. It's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that they'll fix it. No real problem there. Okay, so looking at some of these other uh, stories here, how about, how about this one? We can get a little outraged. I, I think we're mature enough. We can handle this, especially if you live in Dallas, because One thing that our cybersecurity segments and, you know, Scott Schober and other people on the show have uh, come on the program to talk about is the fact that timeliness of data issues is super important. Uh, Usually, it's companies losing data to hackers. This one, a little bit different because they didn't lose it to hackers. They lost it to themselves. And I'll explain. Dallas... And the authorities there lost 8 terabytes of criminal case data during bungled migration, says the DA, four months afterwards. It's pretty crazy. And a murder trial affected last week and a bungled data migration of a network drive caused the deletion of 22 terabytes of information from U.S. police force systems including files in a murder trial, according to local reports. So I'm guessing that the title says 8 terabytes and then the article says 22. Uh, It says that, uh, you know, they destroyed 22 terabytes, 14 terabytes were recovered, so that's something, but then 8 terabytes remain missing and are believed to be unrecoverable. Wow, I don't even know how that happens. So they mentioned that the Dallas Police Department and the City of Dallas Information and Technology Services Department informed the administration that uh, this happened in April 2021, and the city discovered that multiple terabytes of the data have been deleted during migration on the network drive. Backup, backup, backup. It's uh, It applies to everyone in every system. So, backup, backup, backup. Uh, they mentioned that the affected criminal files uh, include those created before uh, the 28th of July, 2020. The prosecutor said that the precise number is currently unknown. It added that effective today, all prosecutors have been instructed to verify uh, with the filing detective that all evidence files were shared with our office via tech share before disposing of the case. Should there be any missing files in a case, the prosecutor will have a written disclosure based upon the information. That is bad. Yes, of course, backup, backup, backup. Uh, so CBS Dallas Fort Worth, a local TV station, reported that murder suspect Jonathan Pitts was due to stand trial on Thursday, but was instead been released on bail because his files were deleted in the blunder. 
So obviously, innocent until proven guilty, but the fact that they had to release him on bail because they just straight up deleted the evidence, that's uh, that's what we in the industry like to call no bueno. No bueno. The details were apparently revealed by a prosecutor in a motion filed last week, just a day before the trial had had been due to begin. Case files typically contain documents, images, video, logs of evidence, and more evidence going either way. In Pitt's case, may yet be recovered, so the trial is not necessarily off for good. But it's enough for him to be released on bail. It's, uh... Yeah. So district attorney uh, claimed that the that while police were immediately aware of what happened, it took them four months to come clean with the prosecutor's office. Meanwhile, the local mayor said he is blindsided by the data loss. Clearly a lack of oversight in how this happened, what happened, when it happened. Yeah, they, uh, you know, someone there thought, oh, no, we can get it back. We can get it back. We can get it back. And like, I kind of get it when it's, you know, kind of your own information and you're like, oh, you know, we've already recovered 14 terabytes. I, you know, we just need another week and we can get, you know, another two terabytes or we can, you know, finish recovering this. Spending four months and not letting people kind of start to rebuild the data that was lost or in some cases not lost, that is extremely irresponsible by uh, law enforcement there. So they mentioned that, uh, yeah, earlier this year, Britain's home office managed to uh, lose 400,000 criminal evidence from a Fujitsu-provided mainframe backup appliance. Meanwhile, in France, cloud operator OVH suffered an equally catastrophic data uh, data loss after a fire in March gutted one of its data cent- centers in Strasbourg, essentially saying... Data loss happens all the time. It doesn't matter how prepared you think you are, uh, except for Ford, who has his music backed up, his photo on three different hard drives, and everything else, I'm sure, on two other hard drives in other locations. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been quite a while since we had a purely, uh, you know, kind of data safety kind of show, but the, you know, kind of the skinny of it is don't be afraid of cloud backup. Uh, have a local backup and have an offsite backup. You know, one that is, let's say, if your house burns down for any reason, uh, you know, just because you have a hard drive sitting on your counter somewhere that with all of your data backed up onto it, if something catastrophic happens in your personal home, then that would be lost as well. So have an offsite backup, cloud backup, and of course a backup that you can easily access uh, with your own two hands. There's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's easy to think, oh, it's just, you know, they're just photos or, you know, whatever, like I'll always have access to them. But one thing that I've heard from people who have lost a large amount of data, especially personal files and personal effects, it's not so much, you know, the programs, the data, so so much and so forth. It's more the stuff that you can never get back, which include family photos, um, you know, just kind of personal documents, things that are irretrievable and you cannot reproduce that's what people really end up missing when something like this happens so back up back up back up yep deeds certificates health documents all of that so there you go uh yeah it's uh there, there's really there's really not too much you can do to be you know kind of overprotective but at the same time like there is a point where you're just being paranoid but not a lot of people reach that point. So there you go. Okay, so that's, uh, that's story number four. Story number five. How about this? <laughs> yes, the time of the future is now. Android 12 beta. Check this one out. It beta is a feature that lets you control your phone with your face. So finally, when you get those inappropriate pictures and you make a face, it will automatically say, uh, ew, for you. That's, uh, no, an oversimplification. But clearly, there's a camera constantly pointing at your face, and it was only a matter of time before it was going to be a completely uh, either on solution or through a simple notification, you can use the camera to direct your phone to do different things. Now, they mentioned that it lets developers create tools for people with disabilities. So that's going to be an obvious one if you don't have access to both your hands, arthritis, if you have um, motor skills, um, motor skill deficiencies. 
uh, things like that. They're saying it's an accessibility suite, but one I truly do think could have uh, could have implications for people even who just want to be able to do this with their face. Uh, camera switches essentially let you use face face gestures to complete a number of actions. For instance, you can set the app to detect when you smile or raise an eyebrow in order to open your notifications panel or quick settings. You so yeah, let's uh, let's hope that uh, you don't you know accidentally smile and you um, you know start your phone starts going haywire. They said that you can also open your mouth to scroll forward or backward. As spotted by XDA developers, the update lets you map around six face gestures to over a dozen phone controls. These can also be tweaked based on gesture size to prevent the app from constantly initiating actions. So I'm guessing that's the difference between an open mouth and an open mouth, which you would then stretch your mouth completely open. Which would be nice, you know, means that you can't, um, you know, you wouldn't accidentally open your settings every time you're talking while using your phone. Uh, camera switches, uh, camera switches builds upon the switch access feature in Android Accessibility Suite, which lets you interact with your device without using a touchscreen. Depending on the context, this could be done using an external device such as a keyboard via a USB or Bluetooth connection, or by pressing the built-in buttons on your phone. In that sense, camera switches takes the feature up a notch by by introducing gestures to the mix. Seeing as most people are already accustomed to unlocking the, their phones with their face, although very unsafe, would not recommend that from a security standpoint, but still, uh, it shouldn't be completely foreign. Now, however, uh, Android 12's privacy dashboard already includes a status indicator for both the camera and the mic. This feature may be unnecessary. XDA also was able to sideload the app's APK to get the new feature on Android 11. So, yeah, it uh, seems to be completely software-based, something that is uh, integrated with the camera itself. So, yeah, it, uh, it could be coming to more devices sooner and sooner. And, hey, when it comes to technology, you know, we always love some good accessibility features. Because, yeah, you know, not everyone is fully... Uh, equipped with, you know, perfectly working hands and arms and all that good stuff. Uh, and hey, you know, what it, what it, what is accessibility today is just straight up functionality for the rest of us. It happens all the time, including things like, you know, just talking to systems and more. So there you go. Okay, that's, uh, that's story number five. Story number six. This one is already taken care of. So... Don't want to freak anyone out, but Wikipedia, if you didn't know, if you didn't know, um, yeah, uh, Wikipedia can be edited by almost anyone. It does not take long to kind of get verified and, you know, any random user can add information to a Wikipedia page. And the important part is that any information added is sourced. So that's where you know, a lot of the kind of problems get avoided is because they, uh, yep, uh, that's where they kind of get avoided is because if they're not sourced, then they get taken down. Well, one unsourced change happened to 53,000 pages. And sorry if this offends anyone, but, you know, obviously there are stupid edgelord kids everywhere on the internet. And, Well, Wikipedia is no different, saying that Wikipedia Vandal adds swastikas to 53,000 pages. Very impressive, and I'm sure some kind of bot or automated system, because clearly no one goes to 53,000 pages and does this immediately. But here we go. Chris Holt over at Engadget, admins swiftly fixed the issue and banned the user behind the attack, but hey, Wikipedia Vandalism causes a lot of problems. Wikipedia vandalism is hardly a new phenomenon, but one user was able to add swastikas to tens of 
thousands of articles. Among the pages that were defaced include uh, leaders such as uh, President Joe Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, Justin Trudeau of Canada, uh, articles for celebrities including Jennifer Lopez, Ben Affleck, and Madonna were also affected. Seems like they were trying to, uh, you know, get uh, some high profile people to be associated with swastikas. Awful. The person responsible edited a template that was used on around 53,000 pages. As such, the vandal defaced pages that are locked and supposed to have greater protection from such attacks. Wikipedia administrators fixed the problem soon after it emerged on Monday morning and the user has been banned indefinitely. One would hope so. So it sounds like there is a predefined uh, template that I'm sure has a lot of formatting and, you know, kind of early life education, you know, things like that. And, you know, some formatting with, uh, some special characters. It seems like they just simply for, for whatever reason, were able to, uh, so, and, and actually the next uh, paragraph here kind of uh, explain the, explains this. One admin noted that the most widely used templates are locked, but it seems that some of them remain uh, remain editable, hard word for me, I'm sorry, by anyone or, as in this case, a newish user who makes some good faith edits at first. Uh, admins protect uh, protected some more common templates in the wake of the vandalism. So there you go. So there, uh, you know. So this user kind of acted like they were a perfectly normal, well-to-do uh, editor of Wikipedia. And then when they gained a little bit of trust, I'm sure that they have an automated system that you know kind of gives them points and lets them do more and more as they get more invested into Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, edited the template, and that again easily inf- uh, easily infected, or I should say, affected 53,000 different pages. So it makes sense. It wasn't exactly targeted, but it did have wide-reaching effects. Uh, They mentioned that uh, the unacceptable attack violates a number of Wikipedia's policy, and they said that most vandalism on Wikipedia is corrected within five minutes, as we saw today. Even though the site is enormous and ever-evolving, it's encouraging that administrators are able to detect and resolve major defacement incidents swiftly. It's actually impressive that anyone was even able to notice this. Uh, I guess Wikipedia is a large enough resource that you know people are going to be constantly checking it every minute of the day. It, it's like those two minutes where Google has an issue with its DNS provider, and you know, like Google Brazil is down for like two minutes, and there's always like articles that are like Google Brazil, it's dead, and you know, uh, how long is it going to be dead for? And it. It only takes like a little bit, but I guess so many people use it, it happens so quickly. So there you go. Uh, Wikipedia, for those who don't know, I, I'm wondering how many uh, how many employees does Wikipedia have? Because it used to be something ridiculously small for such a huge influence. Uh, they said back in 2012, there were 140 employees with a revenue about $38 million, and of course, for those who don't know about Wikipedia, they are vehemently against uh, advertising, like banner ads and things like that. So they don't advertise on their website at all because they see it as, you know, the internet's uh, encyclopedia. It's uh, something for everyone to go and learn information without being, you know, kind of bombarded with ads or things like that. So, yeah, in 2016, there were 280 employees, and in 2020, there were 450 employees and contractors. So, there you go. And many current employees had their start as respected Wikipedia volunteers. So, there you go. It's, uh, you know, and, and, I even recall that, like, you know, back in like 2010 and, tw- you know, 2008, 2010, when it was really taking off, there were like 40 full time employees through this organization. It was really, really crazy. Um, yeah. And they said that uh, <laughs> Starfleet Airheads. Yeah. But um, yeah. So it's an organization with so few members, like, you know, their website is visited, uh, you know, 
tens of millions of time a week, a month, or a year, or whatever. They're one of the most visited websites on the internet. And then when you put that side by side with like Amazon, which is also one of the most widely used services on the internet, uh, clearly one doesn't ship a product. But again, just when it comes to server backend, 400 people versus Amazon's 1 million people. And I bet you when it comes to network engineers, uh, you know, it dwarfs anything that Wikipedia does. Um, they're providing a, a service on a shoestring budget with the bare minimum number of employees. And the fact that they're still able to really fix this as quickly as they do really goes to show that they have a good system in place. So there you go. It's uh, kudos to Wikipedia. And hey, it's essentially an inside hack. And those are some of the hardest ones to actually deal with is because, you know, you trust those people, you know, they, they have gained your trust. You can't just say, Oh, you know, don't do that because Hey, they're already in. Okay. Uh, let's talk about, eh, this is a rather long one. Let's talk about, um, (laughs) Google real quick. Speaking of them, and how Sonos, if you don't recall, Sonos had the first smart speaker for that system. And they're saying that uh, the they won an injunction, or at least an early patent victory, against the Google smart speakers. Because before, it was like Sonos, and that was it, like if you wanted to. And then, of course, Google came out with their own, and now it looks like there's a bit of... Uh, a little bit of a back and forth here. So they said that in January 2020, Sonos brought a patent infringement case against Google tar- uh, targeting Google smart speakers, the home and later the Nest audio line. Sonos is the orig- is the originator of the internet connected speakers that easily hook up to streaming services, while the speakers that Google provides combine a similar feature set with voice activated Google Assistant commands. So here Sonos tell the story. Google got a behind the scenes look at the hardware in 2013. And when Google agreed to build Google Play Music support for Sonos speakers, uh, Sonos claims that, uh, yeah, that uh, that they used, uh, that Sonos claims, and I'm just going to say instead of Google, I'm going to say they, because I feel like I'm activating a lot of people's smart assistants. Uh, Sonos says that they uh, use the access to blatantly and knowingly copy the uh, Sonos audio features for their home speakers, which launched in 2016. And, you know, it's kind of obvious that that's how that went down. Uh, To an extent, I mean, I've always wondered this. Um, Whenever a provider makes the platform and, you know, makes the service, makes the platform, and makes products on those platforms, it's like when Apple looks at their own app store and they say, you know, this app is doing really, really well. Clearly, it's a feature that a lot of our users want. Let's make that a standard feature on the iPhone, and it kind of screws over any third-party app. You know, think of things like uh, podcasting apps. You know, who, who the heck is going to download uh, a podcasting app when Apple has their own podcasting uh, service kind of built into it? Uh, little things like that, you know, really make you wonder how how competitive can these things really be? And so however you want to measure it, Sonos is a tiny company compared to the tech giant. They're saying that Sonos is about a $5 billion market cap, whereas Google, Amazon, and Apple all each have a, um, a market cap of about 1.5 trillion or more. Yeah, not an easy fight to take on. To make matters worse, and of course more complicated for Sonos, the company relies on both Google and Amazon to do business in search, advertising, and retail sales, so it's worried about retaliation from the two giants. Because it's hard to have an, uh, a, a nice, friendly lawsuit between the two. So there you go. Uh, They said that plus once Amazon and Google entered the market, Sonos was forced to adopt support for both voice assistants in order to compete. Back in 2020, Sonos said that Amazon also seemed to be using its technology, but it would focus its legal efforts on Google at first, I'm sure. Um, 
Sonos was the original. You know, there, there was no doubt that when it came to smart speakers, they were the original. Uh, you know, we had Sandy Berger on the show talking about them back then. And the thing that made it so that Sonos wouldn't be, you know, kind of the head and shoulders uh, victor here was the fact that Sonos was selling their smart digital speakers for, if I recall, like five or six hundred dollars a piece. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, just just couch change, one point three trillion dollars. Yeah, uh, no, it, essentially Sonos with its five billion dollar market cap, which is a lot of money, is just chump change to these larger companies that can throw every resource at them to defeat them. But still, Sonos was the original uh, smart speaker, but you know they came out years before anyone else, but you know there was not wide there was not widespread support and by the time that they got widespread support, uh, the other companies had launched their products and their services and for a much cheaper cost. You know, Amazon was the first one to kind of hit that $99 price point with their original smart speaker. And then of course, Google had theirs at like $29, $39, $49, depending on which sale you bought it on. Sonos was just never able to uh, really compete price-wise with these other much larger entities. So meanwhile, Google said that we do not use Sonos' technology and we compete on the quality of our products and the merit of our ideas. We disagree with this uh, preliminary ruling and will continue to make the case uh, in the upcoming review process. So there you go. They disagree and they disagree completely. I'm shocked. You're shocked. Everyone shocked. But yeah, this seems like a classic case of whenever a company makes, you know, provides the platform, provides the services, and then competes with people who try to, um, you know, compete against their services, much like when Amazon has their Amazon Basics, and they, you know, they have, let's say, a thousand different people selling umbrellas on Amazon, which, uh, you know, I'm sure the number is much more, but then Amazon itself comes out with their own cheaply made umbrella. Like, is that really fair? Is that really competitive in that kind of market? So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, so there you go. Um, I, I don't know if Sonos is going to be able to, you know, kind of uh, ring this one out. If it goes like any other product, uh, kind of patent copyright issue, these things usually fight their way through the court for about 10 years, and then uh, one side ends up paying the other uh, a big chunk of change, and nothing really comes from it. So, Sonos, you have been defeated in the area of smart speakers, but was it fair? That's something that I, too, would be interested to know. I don't know. Definitely have to wait and see. So we have time for just one more story, if we're quick about it, and I think we'll do this one about Walmart. Walmart has so many issues, and I'm not going to talk about a lot of them, but one that apparently I did not know they had was this idea that they were harboring an idea for cryptocurrency. Who knew cryptocurrency would be a thing that Walmart would be interested in? Walmart is looking to hire a new senior director to develop a new digital currency products, possibly including cryptocurrency payments, according to the company's job site. The move mirrors a similar interest uh, shown by Walmart's sworn enemy, Amazon, which wants to hire someone to head up cryptocurrency products. And that's something that happened uh, two or three weeks ago that kind of sent cryptocurrency uh, higher and higher was this idea that potentially, potentially, uh, Amazon would accept cryptocurrency for uh, for products. Uh, yeah, and then, of course, coming up with the name for this thing, uh you know, wall, wall cash, wall coin, wall pay, uh, wall marticoin. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what it would actually be called. I'm beginning to think it's more of, you know, uh, like obviously the first step would be a payment system that people could use cryptocurrency to check out at Walmart at, you know, to be able to verify and accept the coin, do it very quickly. Transactions happen instantly, all that good stuff. Uh, the next step would be to create their own cryptocurrency because that is super easy. Like once you have the payment infrastructure in place, what's to keep you from creating your own cryptocurrency? And that's the important part. 
They said that this shouldn't be too surprising, even though Amazon denied claims it was preparing to start accepting Bitcoin. Uh, Cryptocurrency and blockchain in general have had a bit of a moment during the pandemic. So whether it's the rise of the blockchain linked collectible NFTs, um, yeah, so NFTs, I'm glad that those went away so quickly, or major theater chains like AMC decided that they'll accept crypto payments to appeal to new, very online audience, people seem very interested in playing with the the speculative digital assets. Walmart and Amazon might just be making sure their bases are covered, but a future where they do accept alternative payment methods also feels increasingly possible. It's a uh, Waldo. Yes, Waldo. Absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's a crazy idea, but obviously they want to be able to accept these payments if they become viable. Some would claim that they're, they already are viable, but they're very volatile and companies are afraid of volatility. They want to make sure that when you buy $100 worth of products, they end up with $100 worth of cryptocurrency, which doesn't always happen. Ladies and gentlemen, we're flat out of time. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, We hope you had a good time. We'll be back tomorrow, probably with a special segment. Everyone have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.